Welcome back to Sakima's Ridge Homestead. Today's video is another one of our classes from our Community of Eight Preparedness Group. Today, we learn how to properly draw our handguns from concealment and also how to properly reload with doing magazine changes. Our firearms instructor is a certified instructor and also a competitive shooter, and he is very knowledgeable. I tried to focus the video mostly on his teaching and not so much of the rest of the members of the group manipulating their firearms so that what he taught was the most important thing out of this class. And just as a side note, all the firearms and magazines were safety checked twice before we started the class. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to our channel. We're, we're glad, glad you're, you're here. here. All right, so for those of you that have been at my previous dry fire training classes, what type of holster do I always recommend? Servo. No. Absolutely not <laughs> I do not recommend any type of holster that requires the use of your trigger finger in order to activate. Why? Because you shoot yourself in the foot. Well, you might not necessarily shoot yourself in the foot, but you could. It has a much higher likelihood because when you have to use your trigger finger to activate your holster, it can cause a sympathetic reflex and cause you to accidentally pull your trigger on the draw, which is not something that you want to contend with when you're trying to get your firearm out to defend your life, right? If you are already shooting yourself in the foot, you're already at a severe disadvantage <laughs> compared to where you would be otherwise. You're literally shooting yourself in the foot. So that being said, what I recommend is, we're talking about concealed carry today, so I recommend passive retention holsters, which can be out the waistband or in the waistband. I recommend Kydex, specifically molded to fit your individual firearms, alright? Why don't I like leather? Anyone? It bends. It gets soft. It gets soft, it bends, it gets old. Okay, the thing with leather way. is that it deteriorates over time. Kydex doesn't deteriorate over time. It can get damaged and it can get broken, but it's not going to become loose, soft, saggy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to cause the gun to have a very loose fit inside or outside of your pant line. And the most important part is it's, Kydex is going to be very rigid and it's not going to get in the way of your trigger as you reholster your firearm. All right? If you can seal carry every day right now, then you know that unholstering and reholstering your firearm, you do it probably three or four times a day, depending on what you're doing. And if you can reduce the likelihood of you having any kind of negligent discharge from it snagging on your shirt, your pants, your improper holster, or what have you, you want to take every chance that you can to reduce that risk. Because the most dangerous part of a concealed carrier's day is when they unholster and reholster their firearm. All right? That's the most common reason why negligent discharges happen. No one wants that to happen. So if you don't have a Kydex holster right now, that's fine. This is just tri fire training. I would highly recommend before participating in one of our live fire events, you get some type of either hybrid Kydex holster with a synthetic backing or even a leather backing if you really prefer the leather. That way the backing, normally the backings have like a piece of polymer or something to support them so it doesn't become as flimsy and as deteriorated as the regular leather holsters. Or you have a full Kydex holster that allows you to properly hold and retain your firearm and be able to draw it properly without having to worry about any kind of uh, trigger issues. All right. um, that being said, the first thing we're going to do here is we're all going to line up on these white lines. So if everyone wants to come up here and let's see if we have enough room to line everyone up. Facing, Facing this way. Before anyone draws anything, I'm going to get out from down the lane. So. <laughs> Looks like we have just enough room for everyone. So everyone is going to pick a target, and we're going to be using that target pretty much as your indexing target for this entire time. All right. So right there, you're at 10 feet from that line. These are one-third silhouette targets, which means you're at the equivalent of about 30 feet away if you're going to be aiming at a human-sized target. All right. Who knows what the minimum safe distance is for a potential hostile threat? of when you should be preparing to get your firearm out if you see an obviously clear deadly threat approaching you. 30 feet. 21 feet. That is called the Tuller Principle. It's basically that if an uh, armed threat that has only a close combat weapon like a knife or something is going to be coming at you, you have approximately 21 feet for the average person to be able to respond. That is assuming you have at least a two second draw to first shot. All right. From concealment, your goal should be to train to have at least a two second draw to first shot. Preferably, two second draw to two shots because you're going to want to put two shots in that deadly threat before it reaches your position. All right. Now that being said, 
that's going to be a lot harder than it seems. That's kind of a small target from 10 feet away when you're going to be drawing and trying to pull two seconds, right? So we're going to develop that in several different ways today. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do some slow fire training. We're going to have your firearm out already, and I'm going to have you balance a penny or a quarter on the front side of your pistol while you shoot at that target nice and slow. That's going to train your trigger and your ability to hold those sights on that target throughout the entire cycle of you pulling that trigger without moving that firearm. All right? That's going to be important for the accuracy aspect in case you do need to pull that shot off at the full 21 feet or greater. Does that make sense? The most common thing that pulls people off of a target is going to be improper trigger discipline and then flinching from recoil. The flinching from recoil you can train yourself out of by doing dry fire training on a regular basis so that you get accustomed to not having the recoil forces hitting you as you shoot. And the, most, the easiest way to fix your uh, trigger finger issues is going to be to repeatedly pull the trigger while you have something to show that you're holding the firearm steady while going through the whole trigger pull cycle. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing, <coughs> how many people do I have on this line? Ten? Nine? Everyone's going to get a penny. Penny for you. 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 Penny for everyone. Don't thank me. Thank Carl and Julie. I'm pretty sure these are their pennies. All right. What you're going to end up doing, you're going to be in front of one of these targets. No one draw yet, because I'm just demonstrating. And... Set on this one. This is not typically the one that I do this with. You're going to aim at your target, line up your sights, pull the trigger, and the penny should not fall until you move. Nice <coughs> you know you did it right and you went through the whole trigger pull properly because the penny does not fall off your firearm. If you do it wrong and you have too much movement when you pull the trigger, your penny will fall and then you're going to try again. We're all going to do this independently. Now remember when we do this, no one should be going down range with that white line. And when you reset, reholster your pistol before you pick up your penny so you're not accidentally swiping the person next to you with your unloaded firearm. Does that make sense? Always be conscious of where your muzzle is pointed. I'm going to be going up and down the line, checking your grip and checking how you're doing it as you do it. And once you're done with five complete successful ones, we're going to move on to the next step of the dry fire training. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about this drill? This is a very easy, cheap one you can do at home. It'll cost you one penny. Oh, how much does firearm cost? Don't worry about that. All right. Nerf guns. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and draw from the holster. Make sure you're keeping it in a safe direction. Your finger should not be on the trigger. Finger should be off the trigger. Go ahead and cock the firearm. Make sure it's cocked before you put the penny on the sight, and then whenever you're ready, put the penny on the sight. You want to start on the side of the room, I'll go to that side of the room. Okay, hold on, I gotta catch the penny. Mm -hmm. I ran away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the front mm -hmm. side. Oh, so wow. actually bounce on the front mm -hmm. side itself. Oh my God. And whenever you're ready, nice and slow, mm -hmm. pull your shirt. Oh. 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 And you're going to turn it down the room, Rookie move. Man, I don't have any shoes. I've been wearing them in my uh, four shoes and my packing boots and stuff. All right. So everyone has five successful trigger pulls without dropping the penny, right? Yeah. Yes. That's good. That means that you should be able to pull your trigger successfully all the way to the back throughout the entire trigger pull cycle while still keeping your sights on that target the way they should be. All right. Now, what's the next most important part of the draw? Establishing a proper grip. All right. So before you can get to that point where you're actually on target pulling the trigger and pulling the trigger properly, the thing that sets up that whole system of from start to finish is your initial draw or your initial grip on the draw. All right. So at the first, when you grab that firearm, you should be able to come down on it, grab it the same way every single time, have a good firm grip on it, pull it out, and be able to go straight out to your target. All right. If you don't have a proper grip from the first time that you come down on that firearm, you're going to have issues right from the get-go. You're not going to have time to correct your grip. You're not going to have time to be able to readjust yourself once you're on target, assuming that you have a potential lethal threat right there in front of you. Because remember, we're assuming that 
your life's in danger at that very second, or else you wouldn't be taking your firearm out of the holster in the first place, right? Who knows how long did the average defensive situation last? You've been over this several times. Eight seconds. Seven. Seven seconds. All right. So if the average defensive situation lasts only seven seconds, and it takes you 0.6 seconds to identify that you're under attack, and two seconds to get your firearm out of the fight, you've already wasted almost half your time, right? Time buys you options in defensive situations. If you're wasting time trying to fix your grip because you can't get hits on target because you pulled it out and it was halfway in your hand, halfway out of your hand, it's not helping you at all. What wins firefights and what saves your life is putting center mass hits on target, not how quickly you can miss. Does that make sense to everyone? And most of the time you're going to end up putting multiple hits on that target because believe it or not, it normally takes more than one good hit to stop a threat. Especially if that threat is under the influence of some kind of narcotic or something. Which, I have no idea what normally leads people to decide to attack other people, but I would assume that they're somehow out of their normal state of mind, in which case you wouldn't want to trust the fact that one round is going to stop them. <coughs> so, that being said, the next drill is going to be very simple. We're going to do the five times principle. If it should take you two seconds to pull your firearm out and shoot that target with one shot, then we are going to make it take 10 seconds and we're going to do it properly every single time, making sure that we're going through every single step of the draw process, really focusing on making sure that we have a good grip on the firearm, we acquire our sights, we're lining up our sights, we're pushing out the way we should be, we're indexing on the target as we should be so that everything's perfect and we work our way down in time from there. Does that make sense? So the first time we're going to do this, we're going to do it five times at a 10 second draw. Then we're going to do it five times at an 8 second draw. Then we're going to do it five times at a 6 second draw, so on and so forth. We're going to work our way all the way down to two seconds. And then for those of you that have trained enough or know what's going on enough, we're going to work our way all the way down to one second. One second is very fast. All right. We're going to be using this. It's called a shot timer. To give you an idea of how long two seconds is before we do the five times part, this is going to be two seconds from one beat to the next. That seems like a pretty long time. It's pretty reasonable, right? How many movements? So, two seconds from concealment doesn't seem too bad. When we are going to be doing this drill, we're going to be doing ten seconds. Which, let me adjust this to ten seconds real quick. <coughs> ten seconds is a very long time. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's people that can do that in 0.8 seconds. They can draw in first shot from consumer in 0.8 seconds. I know, I've seen it. I've trained with them before. It's pretty intense. So, 10 seconds is a long time. It's like boiling water. <laughs> it's a long time, right? So, your goal is to slowly go through your entire draw cycle to make it last that entire second. So you don't want to go faster than that 10 seconds. You don't want to go slower than that 10 seconds. As you go through your draw cycle, you want to think in your head, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, etc. Because you're purposely forcing yourself to go through the proper motions and practicing your fundamentals throughout that entire draw cycle. Does that make sense? So if you could hold my timer for a minute, when I say go, you're just <laughs> The one on top that says go. And I'm going to demonstrate what it should look like. Go ahead and hit go. So the first thing that's moving is this hand and this hand at the same time. You're coming up, lifting your cover garment, you're coming down on your firearm. All the way down so that the top of your hand is coming to the very top of it. Right? Um, I'm explaining it as I go. <laughs> the top one is going to the very top of it and you're pushing down on the very top so that you have no gap up here on your firearm. Does that make sense? Does everyone see that there's no gap up there? Wrap your hand around, you pull straight out, and then you immediately start indexing towards your target, and you push out, meaning this hand as you push out. You're going to acquire this sight first while you're still threat focused, so you're looking at your threat, and you're bringing your firearm 
up in your field of view, the first thing you're going to see is your front sight. You're going to immediately focus on your front sight, bring it to alignment, and then engage your target and pull the trigger once you're holding in that azo. Does that make sense to everyone? So when I'm explaining it, I'm going to make it go 10 seconds and you'll see what it looks like. Ready? Don't hold your trigger after you pull it. Too little, too quick. Just by about a second. But you're going to go nice and slow. Make sense? We're going to do that five times. Then we're going to go to eight seconds. Six seconds, etc., etc. We're going to increase the speed every single time. Do not lose your fundamentals. If you start losing your fundamentals, you're not acquiring the sight picture properly. You're not gripping it properly. You feel your grips off. You don't have your support hand coming up properly and pushing out. You're not acquiring your front sight as you come up. Make sure that you stop yourself and reaffix it. The time isn't as important as practicing the fundamentals. What we're doing is we're building muscle memory. So that when and if you have to use this in a defensive situation, you don't have to think about it. It just happens. You know that you need that firearm in the fight, and it just happens. You know that you need to get that gun out, and it just happens. That's how you get to those speeds of under 1.5 to 1 second. You don't think about the draw. You don't think about your hand positioning. You don't think about your sights. You just have it there when you need it. And that's the only way to get that way is to start with a very slow, making sure that you're doing everything very meticulously and practicing those fundamentals, and then working your way to faster speeds. Does that make sense, everyone? Any questions? All right, everyone to the firing line. Remember, it's going to be... 10 seconds. So right when this beeps, we're going to start counting down. If your pistol is not cocked, make sure you go ahead and take it out and cock it now. And right as it beeps, you should be pulling that trigger within a second or so. Alright? Here we go. Holster. Make sure you hook your gun into the holster. Don't just shove it in without looking. That's how you accidentally snag a trigger. You get an extra hole, not a piercing. <laughs> All right. So there was a couple of people that I saw. They were bringing their gun up from very low. So they pulled it out. They draw. They went to low ready. Then they came up. Make sure that as you come out of the holster, you're indexing towards the target and pushing out. The issue is if you don't have time to come all the way up from here and your threat's already on you, they're going to be able to stop you from coming up on target. They're going to be able to get that firearm away from you. If your firearm is already indexed and you need to pull that shot early, when they're already on top of you almost, then you can pull that shot early. For those of you that were at our close quarters training and our defense against knives training and stuff at the FTX, it's the same concept that you practice there where sometimes you have to shoot without getting a proper sight picture. Right now we're training to get a proper sight picture, but we want to make sure that we set ourselves up for that event throughout the, throughout the entire draw process. Does that make sense? Because you don't know if they're going to be on top of you that fast or not. They could be Usain Bolt and get on you in like less than a second and a half, or they could be some fat slow guy that's going to get you on in four seconds. You don't know. All you know is that they're coming at you and bad things are happening. Right? Mm -hmm. Alright, go ahead and reset. Ten seconds is a long time. Yeah, It'll feel like that, but wait until we're down to two seconds. <laughs> Make sure you're focusing on that proper grip. Make sure you're focusing on that proper sight picture. Every little tidbit of that draw. Make sure you're getting your undergarment or your cover garment out of the way properly. Make sure that you're not snagging anything as you come up. All right. seconds. It's going to be a little bit quicker. Really focus on making sure that you have a good grip. Really focus on making sure you're getting a proper sight picture before you pull that trigger. 
Make sure that everything's lined up and make sure you're in the center of that A zone. If you have that cover garment on, don't be afraid to rip that cover garment out of the way. Because in a real situation, you're not going to have time to just gently scoot it away from your gun. You're going to want to hike that thing out of the way as quickly and as hard as possible so that you have a clear draw path. The last thing you want is on the draw to snag your gun on your hoodie or your shirt or something and have it fly out of your hands. That's a bad day for everyone involved. Except for the bad guy, of course. <laughs> If you're, not, if you're not getting a proper full grip on your firearm right from the draw on the initial, when you come down on it, you might have to think about readjusting how you carry in your holster because your holster might be too deep. You need to have that proper full grip right when you come down on it. You have to kind of balance that concealability, comfort, and practicality factor. A little tiny micro gun isn't going to do you any good if you can't get a proper hold on it when you pull it out. Make sure you're filling that gap in between the beaver tail and the actual, your hand and the actual grip. Make sure that when you come up on that target, you're acquiring that front sight, lining it up from that front sight index, getting a good sight picture on that A zone, and then pulling the trigger. Make sure you're not jerking it or flinching it when you pull that trigger. That's going to be the hardest part once we start to get into these faster speeds, making sure that you have a good follow through. some of the harder times. Don't lose those fundamentals, but make sure that you're going through that whole draw stroke as quick, not necessarily as quick as you can, but quick enough because we're going down to three seconds. All right. If you can make it under three seconds comfortably, great. If you can't, keep in mind that you're going to have to practice a lot more to make sure that you're going to be able to get that firearm to play effectively and quickly. Because remember, it's going to need to be every time when your life depends on it, you're not going to want to have to wrestle with it or fight with it or come out with a bad grip or not have a good proper sight picture when you have to have a sight picture. Here we go, three seconds. Well, that's quicker than a lot of people thought. We skipped four seconds. We did skip four seconds. We did that on purpose. Remember, three seconds is in the red area still. We should be at two or under. So three seconds should still be plenty enough time to get in there, get on target, and get a shot off. It's once we get down to two seconds and sub two seconds that we should be having a real hard time with things. Right now you should still be able to maintain your fundamentals and get on that target and pull that trigger. Don't cheat yourself. If you don't have your sights on that target, you're going to hit grandma on the third story window across the street. You don't want that to happen. You want to hit the bad guy, not the innocent bystander behind the bad guy. Make sure your target's going to get hit, not anything that you don't want to get hit. You need to be able to call your shot before you crack that trigger. Make sense? Don't get disappointed in yourself. If you're not making the three seconds, just know you got to train more and you got to build up that muscle memory. If you are making that three seconds, get ready for the two seconds. <laughs> All right. Make sure on this draw, you're coming up and pushing out. Make sure you're indexing in the direction of the target immediately. I'm seeing a lot of swinging up now, now that we're losing our fundamentals from the speed. So make sure that the second it comes out of that holster, it begins to index in the direction of the target. We're going down to two and a half. 
<laughs> Keep your fundamentals. Make sure you're indexing on that target the second you come out of the holster. Make sure you have that sight picture before you crack that shot. You can't miss fast enough to win. What's a half a second? Half a Now we're starting to get sloppy. So when you're training at home, if you train at home, make sure to work your way down from that 10 seconds all the way down. If you have a timer, if you don't have a timer, that's fine. You can set a timer on your phone or something. But you want to be able to work your way down to that two second mark. All right? That is a simple draw, dry fire that you can practice at home. Work your way down in the 10 seconds. Don't cheat yourself. That's the biggest thing. What I see all too often, especially in the competitive shooting circuit, is people will say, oh, I have a .7, draw the first shot, dry fire. And they go to the range, and they draw it, and they shoot in .7 seconds, their round flies off into the distance somewhere. Or bounces off the ground. Bounces off the ground, or doesn't go anywhere near the target. Dry fire does not tell you where your round could possibly be impacted. It only tells you how fast you're moving. All right? Don't confuse that with actual performance. Dry fire needs to be mixed with live fire in your training routine. You could be the best, world's best dry fire in the world for no reason, but until you actually put holes in paper or you put hits on target, it's not going to translate to anything. You're not going to have those recoil impulses built into your muscle memory. You're not going to have that actual impact and the actual visual effect of having knowing where your shots are hitting when you do that draw. You need to have that incorporated into that. How often should you be uh, live fire training as a concealed carry holder? Once a month. At least 50 rounds a month. If you're a concealed carry holder, and you're concealed carry on a regular basis, you should be shooting 50 rounds a month. All right? Now, there are training drills that you can do. Some ranges don't let you draw from the holster or anything, but being able to draw from the holster is much more important properly anyway, than just being able to put holes in paper. I can give a handgun to pretty much anyone and have them put holes in paper at 10, 20 feet within 10, 15 minutes. It's not that difficult. Anyone can put holes in paper with a handgun. That's why firearms were made and they're called the great equalizers. All right? What's difficult is in a high stress situation, while you're defending yourself from an attacker or something, getting that handgun out quickly, getting that handgun out effectively, and being able to put those shots on target when and where they need to be, all right? The best way that you can practice that is by building that muscle memory through dry firing first, and then taking it to the range and applying that training to paper under time constraints, whether it be with a shot timer or with your phone or what have you. But the most important thing is that since you're the one training yourself, don't cheat yourself on that. Does that make sense to everyone? Who's heard of the dot torture drill? What? We did it at the FTX, remember? The May FTX. So who remembers how difficult the dot torture drill was? Oh, yeah. It's a lot harder than people thought it was, right? You're like, oh, this should be easy. You're just standing there and just punching holes in paper. <laughs> it's actually a lot harder than people think it is because it's training your fundamentals. It's training the bare basic aspects of handgun use. It's training proper sight acquisition. It's training proper grip on the draw. It's training proper draw. We didn't even do it under a major time constraint. I just told you guys to run it when we did the dot torture drill, and we were still having a hard time. Imagine having a time constraint of two seconds every time I told you to run that part of the drill. That'd be a lot harder, wouldn't it? So for those of you that aren't aware of what dot torture is, especially left-handed, dot torture is a 50-round drill. 
that if you're only going to shoot 50 rounds of live fire, since I know ammunition is expensive every month, it is a drill for you if you're going to train for CCW. All right, this is the target. You want targets? Take one when you leave. Print plenty of copies. You can use as many as you want. All right, very easy. All it is is ten circles. You just shoot at the ten circles. You shoot at the ten circles in specific ways, though. So circle number one is five shots of slow fire to get you warmed up. So you're just going to come up on that target. You're going to shoot five shots into that circle. The key is do not miss. If you miss, you fail. It's that simple. If you miss any of these shots, you fail. That's what makes dot torture so hard. You have a 100% accuracy rate in order for you to be considered passing. Not a single human being passed during the FTX that we had because I don't think most people are in the dot torture drill before. But it's the best way to uh, build up those handgun skills. All right. The next one is going to be draw, shoot one shot five times. So you're going to draw your gun, you're going to shoot one shot into it. You're draw your gun, you're going to shoot one shot into it. Etc. Etc. Five times. All right. Seems simple enough, right? There's not necessarily any time constraints in it, but if you build that two-second time constraint into it, it helps you build that speed and that repetition that you need to know that you're able to hit these targets quickly and effectively. All right. And typically, there's three different distances you can shoot this from. For beginners, you want to start at three yards. Three yards seems close because that's only nine feet, but it's actually a lot harder than it sounds. I think at the FTX we were doing it from five yards because that's what the average distance is for not beginners. But for beginners, it's three yards. Next one, you're going to draw. You're going to shoot one shot to three and one shot to four. You're going to do that four times. That's going to teach you target transition, trigger reset, and reacquisition of a target. Make sense? So number five, you're going to draw, but you're only going to shoot one-handed. Five separate times. So you're going to draw, shoot one. Draw, shoot one. Maybe you don't have your support hand. Maybe you're already in a confrontation and you need to draw without the use of your support hand because you're using it for something else. You never know. you got to train for those kind of scenarios. All right. Next ones are going to be draw, two shots on six, two shots on seven. Controlled pairs. Who remembers what those are? Pop, pop. Pop, pop. Preferably less than 0.2 seconds between splits. Ideally less than 0.15 seconds between splits, but we won't split hairs on that. Two and two, four times. All right? Eight's the one that kills everyone. I'll tell you what, every time I run this drill, eight's the one that always gets me. Eight is you draw and you shoot weak-handed. Left-handed if you're a righty, right-handed if you're a lefty. One shot each time, five times. That's a lot more difficult than it sounds, especially if you don't not used to training shooting uh, with your weak hand. That's the one that killed me. <clears throat> then the last one is you draw, you shoot one to nine, you reload, you shoot one to ten, and you do that three times. So you draw, you shoot one to nine, you reload, you shoot one to ten. That trains your reloads. Now, I will tell you, as a competition shooter, I incorporate reloads into all of my dry fire training sessions because I reload all the time as a competition shooter. As a self-defender, should you train reloads? Yes. And we can go over quickly at the end of this class how to do reloads properly and everything. However, I will tell you that very, 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 very rarely, unless you have some kind of <coughs> malfunction or something else happens, will you ever have to reload in a self-defense encounter. In fact, I have seen thousands of self-defense videos. I've talked to police and law enforcement from all other type parts of Ohio, and very rarely will even a police officer have to reload his or her firearm in a defensive encounter, even if they're up against multiple attackers, because Modern magazines hold anywhere between 9 and 22 rounds, depending on what you're going to be carrying. And realistically speaking, you should be able to neutralize a target within 2 to 5 rounds. All right? So even if you're using one of those small single stacks with 7 rounds, you should be able to neutralize any target that you're coming up against within that single magazine. In the event that you cannot, you should be able to perform an immediate emergency reload if you need to. All right? um, like I said, the likelihood of that happening is very slim. 
It's incorporated into the dot torture drill because in case you do have a malfunction, you're going to want to get ground in there as quickly as possible. Because in a defensive situation, a handgun's better than a hammer. And once you have a malfunction, unless you can get more rounds into that thing very quickly, you now have a defensive hammer instead of a defensive handgun. Which, you know, hammers are not something that I would like to carry around for defensive purposes. Well, anything can be a hammer. <laughs> anything can be a hammer. Not everything can be a gun. Exactly. All right. Any questions about the dot torture drill or why I recommend it for your live fire training? Any questions about the drawing portion of the dry fire training or the uh, trigger control portion of the dry fire training? All right, so everyone brought empty magazines, correct? Very good. So, who carries magazines in their pockets? No? Well, who carries? Magazine. Who carries a bag of magazine? Jared carries a bag of magazine. Sometimes carry a bag of magazine. So, if we're going to be self defenders and we're going to be prepared for any scenario, we should carry at least one bag of magazine. Even though the chances are we're never going to use it, we're never going to need it, you never know if or when you're going to need it. You're never going to know when your hand is going to experience a malfunction, whether something's going to happen that causes you to need to replace the magazine anyway, or if you're going to be in some kind of strange extended firefight, which is highly unlikely, but it could happen. When and if that does happen, yanking your magazine from underneath your wallet and your keys and all kinds of other stuff in your pocket is probably not the situation you want to be in. I have a story to tell about that. As you guys know, I'm a competition shooter. A long time ago, I used to carry around an extra magazine in my back pocket before I went to a stage. So. I have my gun belt, I got three magazines in my gun belt, but I always wanted to have a fourth one just in case. That was the one that I always put in my gun at the very start. All right, So I always keep it in my back pocket. Come up to the line, make ready, pull the magazine out of your back pocket, rack it, go ahead, get ready to do your stuff, and then shoot your stage, right? Never had an issue with it. About a year and a half into doing that, I did that. Pulled my magazine out of my back pocket like normal, put it in my gun, racked my gun, got ready. Stage starts, buzzer goes off, beep, come up, click. Click, click, drop the mag, put a new mag in it, rack it, click, gun's not going off. What the hell's wrong with my gun? What just happened? You know what happened? Lint. A piece of pocket lint was stuck no in the actual firing pin hole, stopping the firing pin from being able to hit my primers. Oh, my now is that something that you want to happen in a defensive situation? <laughs> no! Does everyone have pocket lint? Yes! The chances of that happening are very slim, but it happened to me, and you know what? Ever since then, I ain't carrying magazines in my pocket. I got an actual magazine holder now that holds my magazines properly without the risk of pocket lint. So, don't be that person that carries your backup magazine deep inside your pocket that number one, you can't get to unless you're taking five to seven seconds to get to it, or number two, it comes out full of all kinds of pocket lint. Or it's backwards. Or it's backwards, down. or all kinds of bad things are happening, all right? So first and foremost, get yourself an actual mag holder if you're going to carry a backup mag, which I recommend. Do you, need, do you need two backup mags? No. You only really need one backup mag. Do you need any backup mags? I guess technically not really if that's your preference, but I would recommend one. How about that? So when you carry your backup mags, you're going to carry them so that they're facing forward. So the rounds sitting in there, which I don't have any rounds in here obviously because we're all unloaded, are going to be facing towards the front of you. All right. When you reload, I'll demonstrate. Bang, 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 click. You're going to bring your firearm, your entire firearm, down in and put your elbow into here, kind of like into your rib cage, kind of tucking it in. That way it stabilizes everything. This is called your work area. Anytime you need to do any kind of remedial action to your firearm, you got a jam, you got something going on, you need to change out the magazine, whatever, you bring it down into your work area so that you can see what's going on, identify what's going on, and being able to work into it in a stable environment. Out here, it's bounced around, maybe you're moving to cover, maybe you're moving to all kinds of different things, maybe you're dozen around. You don't know what's going on, because the thing's bouncing around like crazy, and you try to get a magazine to there, you're going to throw the magazine halfway across the parking lot or wherever you're at. All right? I've had seen that happen plenty of times in competition. You bring it in, right into your ribcage, you're going to take this hand, with your index finger out, you're going to come into your mag pouch. See how I'm coming into my mag pouch with my finger down like this? You're going to grab it, and when you grab it, your finger should be pointing or touching the top of your first round in that magazine. 
That way you can know where you're pointing your finger. Because then all you're going to do, you're going to look directly into this magma, you're going to poke it. And it's that simple. That's the fastest and easiest way to do it. Bang, 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 click, come down, back out. Make sense? If you went to slide lock, which I'm assuming is why you're reloading, same concept. Coming down, dropping the mag, coming back, bring it back out as you come out. So you have it out, come back down, come out, shoot. Make sense? That's the fastest and easiest way to do a reload. If you have your magazine backwards in there, you're going to be fumbling with it. It's not going to be indexed properly. If it goes in backwards, you're going to have bigger issues. If your gun is one of those weird guns that allows the magazine to go in backwards, then you're going to have even bigger issues because you're going to have stuff in there that doesn't belong in the wrong direction. Most guns will not allow the magazine to go in backwards, so you're just going to end up fumbling with it for a few seconds before you can figure out how to get it in. Ideally, you're going to want your reload to be less than a second. How fast is a second? It's pretty fast, right? We just went over that a little bit ago. A second and a half is pretty fast. A second's even faster. You want to get that gun back in the fight as quickly as possible. All right. So, if right. two or three people. To make so, it. what we're going to do? We're going to make sure that during our entire reload cycle, our firearm is facing towards the enemy. We have a firing line here. Do not turn your firearm and point at the person next to you during the entire reload cycle. Make sure it's pointed down range at all times. You're going to pull it back. Put your elbow into your rib cage into your work area. Grab your magazine, properly index it. We're not doing it yet, but this is what you're going to be doing. Take your magazine, properly index it, put it in the mag well, bring it back up. You can rack it, or you can just pull it back up and pull the trigger on target. All right? How was the mag changes? Slow. Slow. It's all right. It's like a train, right? So ideally, you want to get that under a second, two seconds, kind of slow but doable. Keep in mind, when we do all these activities, focus your training around that whole seven seconds that you're going to have to be able to react to anything, really. Because the entire endeavor is going to be over in seven seconds. By the time you realize that there's a threat, by the time you get the firearm in the fight, by the time you're able to respond to that threat, most of that fight's over. You've got to always remember that as a self-defender, you're going to be at an immediate disadvantage. Because since you have the initiative disadvantage, the bad guy always gets the first action. You're always going to come into that fight with less time than the bad guy. And if you're going to come into that fight with less time than the bad guy, you've got to give yourself every advantage to get that time back. Because every quarter second, every half second, every tenth second that you give yourself in that fight gives you more options and a better opportunity to respond to that lethal threat. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any specific individual questions for me regarding any aspect of the dry fire training or anything that you can do at home to get better? All right. Pretty much all I got for the dry fire training today. Thank you everyone for showing up. Um, a little bit after this, if anyone wants any individual instruction on grip or uh, holster or any kind of equipment or anything, you can ask me all you want. That's normally what I reserve the last half hour or so of the class for. All right. That's all I got. Thank you.